Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to TNO The Last of Europe using the special sub mod called the Second to West Russian War. I'm your host, Mr. Shukshin Lover, and right now we're changing hierarchy. What the bad word is this? Pavel, CEO of the Phoenix Corporation, screamed at the top of his lungs. Try not to shoot the messenger, Pavel. The truth is, you're out. From here on out, all major corporate bodies, including Phoenix, will no longer have any political authority within the Russian Federation. The Federal Assembly from here on out is the government of the people, not of the corporate influences. Kachenko explained with a smug smile as he watched the CEO's face become pink as a pig. You and Shukshin, you can't do this to us. We built this federation. It was our money that brought it to prosperity. You only exist because we permit it, Pavel exclaimed as his eyes born to Mikhail's with unrivaled fury. That's President Shukshin for you, Pavel. You may have contributed to the federation by any power you had when former President Pokrishkin or Pokrishkin was in charge is gone. President Shukshin is in charge of the Russian Federation. He has ordered you and every other company to play by the rules. I suggest you comply, Pavel. Karchenko replied with a cold but calm edge to his voice that rattled the CEO. Karchenko smiled as Pavel struggled to come up with a response. The economic minister moved to leave the enraged CEO's office but stopped at the door. He took a deep breath and looked back. Do not underestimate Vasily Shukshin, Pavel. If you so much as try to challenge his authority and the will of the people, he will bring you down before you have a moment to comprehend that what you have unleashed. And with that, Mikhail left the office, greeting grateful workers with a warm smile as they cheered him on, applauding the minister for setting up for their up to their ruthless CEO. For the first time in his life, Pavel was put in his place by the will of the workers, as right now. We are doing uh, prepared for what's ahead. If you'd like to read about that, please go right ahead again. Which I believe I read last time, so. And the West Russian plan. Now, I, I think I read this one as well, but... Oh, Reich's, Reich's minister Havel has been murdered. Oh, boy. Too bad. All them individuals are going to have to go bye-bye. So we're going to do some of this. And then... Actually, what is our support like for now in the Duma? They like us. They're supportive. We definitely need more state Duma seats immediately. And even federal council seats as well. So we got to save our PP. As much as I want to core more stuff, we got to wait. I can't remember if I read this, but after decades of industrial buildup and economic reform have all led up to this moment, a new industrial plan that aims to su succeed the Central Siberian plan and lead the Federation to another age of prosperity. The West Russian plan. The new industrial projects underway and new businesses popping up every day. Western Russia will soon enjoy the same standards of living and prosperity the rest of the Federation enjoys. What's to come, of course. Uh, I can't do this one just yet because we need to have a majority in the Federal Assembly, but we'll get there in due time. What's to come? As the Ekaterinburg native, Vadim had grown used to the milita militarist culture that defined the city since the rule of Konstantin Or Orkosovsky. When the Federation took the city, the sudden introduction of Novosibirsk business centric culture shocked him greatly. The drastic influx of entrepreneurs and managers changed Ekaterinburg nearly overnight. Soon, local elections were held and Boris Yeltsin was elected Oblast Governor. They had endured countless changes, but in recent weeks, change was marching on the horizon again. Ever since President Shushkin's speech, it seemed the entire Federation was on the warpath, its feet firmly set on the road to Moscow. What you're thinking about, Vadim Artyom, his art shift manager, asked. They stood together on the production line, surrounded by the clanging of machines. Vadim sighed, staring at the long line of rifling that filled the assembly belts. The city feels as if, as if it did in the 40s. There was tension. The Vadim showed off as flashes of tanks and screamings entered his mind. Why is Shukshin provoking Germany again? Is he trying to condemn Russia? We have lost the Germans twice. Why would this time be different? He said, rubbing his eyes. Boris placed a hand on his shoulder, a warm smile on his face. I don't know where the future will take us or what will happen when the dust settles, but we have a little faith. But I have a little faith. Russia and our president have been underestimated before. I don't know if we'll prove the doubters wrong, but one thing I've learned is that you should never underestimate the determination of an angry Russian. And with a smile, Artyom walked away, leaving Vadim alone to dwell on his thoughts once more. An uncertain future had, but he had to embrace it. Uh, we got quite a few comments to go through. And let me double check here. Ah, so this is where we put the heavy artillery. I was, I was looking for the tank stuff, but artillery's over here. Interesting. Okay. Jean Kirkpatrick. Oh, John Glenn is gone. Oh, no. Fascist of the world. Watch your back. But we must do cultural revisitation. Why not? Although our sacred motherland has been reunited, many Russians, especially the younger generation, don't fully understand what it means to be a Russian. Years of warlords and various ideologies, ranging from war communism to Nazism, has damaged the Russian psyche and spirit. Russia must, must reclaim its identity. Our history needs to be taught once more, and our customs and traditions reintroduced, our songs played on the streets. We need to remember that Russia is more than a place on the map. It's a people. Now we can do subsidized scientific facilities, which will improve our research facilities, or support the students, which will get more support for President Shushkin. So, uh, research or the other one. Let's take a look here. Cutting edge research. It's already pretty good. Um, 1.81, 1.62. It doesn't really matter. Uh, if we go from here to there, we get more political power, which is not bad. More secondary schooling. We get 7.5% more research speed versus 0.25 more political power. It doesn't really matter. 
I'm going to go get more support. Support the students. The students are the future of our nation. They require our utmost support in helping succeed in their studies. And the Russian Federation is to continue being a scientific juggernaut with some of the world's most advanced scientific facilities. Then it is a necessity that we build new schools and upgrade existing facilities to ensure that the students of Russia have the best resources and equipment available to them. And so, let's get some more support first. And, oh wow, wow, that really sucks. State Duma seats, yeah. What do they make political concessions? Does that mean they get more seats? Hopefully not. Oh, it's going to take a long time to do, but a night to remember. Mikhail clung to his mother's arms as he examined the city blanketed in the winter snow. Years ago, he would have remained indoors, isolating himself from the city beyond the windows of his realm or room. He didn't have any friends. His only company were his parents and his collection of books. The years of anxiety he felt during those years dis dissipated when the Federation finally liberated his home city. Today was a special day. He and his parents had been waiting in line, when he, and the young boy grew increasingly confused with each passing moment. He saw many other adults, whom all stood in pure excitement. After a few minutes, Mikhail had finally worked up the courage to ask his mother what they were doing there. Today is a special day. <clears throat> I hope you remember for the rest of your life, his mother replied. Before he knew it, they walked into the new theater named Parham's Firebird. Ooh! Inside, countless tables scattered around with chairs and plates around. It was warm and bright as a young man with an odd triangle-shaped guitar was trying a playing a tune when his parents told him was Kalinka on the main stage. Soon enough, the trio had sat down at one of the tables and Mikhail began to read the menu. Most of the items were foreign to him and many of his words he didn't recognize. His parents and later, the waiter, helped explain what each item was. During the reading, his parents discuss the many fools, uh, foods from the childhood they'd missed, and Blini? What's that? Mikhail asked. His parents stopped mid sentence for the briefest moment. He sensed sadness before their smiles returned. It was something that they both loved to eat before the, those Swaska lovers tried taking everything away from us. We're free now. We can enjoy the food we miss so dearly, his mother explained in, in, in a warm smile. You're going to be a brother. Whoa. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, there, okay, so the couple comments included. Uh, actually, since we're doing research here, does nuclear research. Increase spending. Yes, it does. So $100 million, $1 billion, $5 billion, $15, $50 billion, So it does. Um, I was saying Shushkin wrong. I thought it was Shushkin. It's Shukshin. So my apologies about that. Um, so it says 40 combat with infantry is very squishy, which is why I usually use it. Um, you should use some more uh, use more tanks, more SBR artillery, and use attack helicopter for more punch. You know what? That's So that's why I'm over here. I'm like, you know what? Let's try something slightly different. As much as I love SPR, like normal tanks and stuff like that, uh, that's 40 soft attack. Getting basic heavies. Speed is probably going to slow us down a little bit. Oh yeah, 14. 14. Oh, what's it? What's the speed of the tanks right now? Which I've never I've never used these in TNO. So right now it's 22. That's that's pretty quick. I don't really want to lower our speed too much, but if it gives us a massive boost to, uh, like, soft attack, because that's that's a lot of soft attack. Jesus Christ. Honestly, between six, if we're going to go slow, the difference between 16 and 14, in my opinion, isn't really that great. Yeah, it's going to use more weight and more uh, supply, but... Actually, can we just keep both of these open? Yeah, we can. My bad. Uh, 24, a little more defense, a little more hardness, which is good. More hard attack. Quite a bit more armor. Reliability is the same. Cost a little more to produce, which is fine. Use a little more fuel, which is fine. I just want to get that extra soft attack. Uh, actually, we're currently tanks. My bad, I want to keep clicking on that button. These tanks... Oh, that was the 80s. Um... Uh, their speed is actually pretty good. Their armor is pretty decent as well. Their soft attack is not nearly as good. So I do want to get a little bit more soft attack. We might as well try it, right? Might as well try it. I've never done this before. So let me know in the comments. Do you use uh, artillery, SP artillery in your campaigns? Because I know it's been recommended to me before. I just have never used it that often. So I'm, I figured, you know what? For this campaign, let's try something a little different. And national education reform. I'd love to do it eventually, but we don't have the support just yet. Um, an armored spearhead? In 1941, the governor, or the Germans didn't break our lines with infantry alone. It was an armored spearhead that shattered the Red Army and stormed the sacred Moscow. Aside from the T-34, the German tanks were more technologically more advanced than our armor and in the far greater numbers. The Federation knows the importance of tanks on the battlefield and will strive to ensure that we're up to par in terms of technological capabilities. That's good. Followed up with... The Falcon's advice. Despite this loss in the recent presidential election, Alexander Pokrushkin has decided to continue working with the new government of the Federation. Whatever reasons, reasons he may have, whether that be to retake power someday or to maintain his stability and unity amongst the Siloviki, his experience as both a leader and an ace pilot during Operation Barbarossa is invaluable. Perhaps now would be a good time to approach the Siberian Falcon and ask for his assistance in reforming the military of the Russian Federation for the conflict ahead. Probably a good idea. And well, we need a lot of stuff here, too. 75, we can't do anything there. Here, we might get actually more radar. That actually might be really good. Aircraft is super good to get. Um, we haven't done anything for air doctrine either. Did we actually finish this? Yeah, we did. That's good. Um, get some more of that because that's going to be super helpful as well. 
Uh, anything outdated yet? No. Honestly, firearms, we're doing quite well, I would say, on. Tanks, jets, planes, super, super important stuff, so. The Falcon's advice. Followed up with. The skies belong to Russia, but the long journey first. Volody brushed the ice off his jacket as he felt the cool breeze on his wind on his face. He knew he would catch his death like this, but he couldn't help but enjoy the wind in his hair. Eventually, he stepped away from the window and closed it. He really needed to stop doing that. Four years ago, he wouldn't have been able to ride on a train. The speed, the motion, it was all still new to him. He sat down and put his hat back on, leaning back into the seats and sipping a bottle of coke he had brought from his home city of Tomsk. The stuff was expensive, but he said to spoil himself since it would be the last time he would be able to get a hold of it for the next four years. Volody. Volody. He didn't want to go on a second tour. He never wanted to be a soldier. Period. He could never forget the things he saw in Magadan and Chita. Ever since the Federation took over <clears throat> the Far East, he had finally settled down. In that time, he had married, had a son, family he loved so very dearly. When the Federation had taken the West, he was just happy. Uh, his wife's small business had grown. He didn't need to worry about getting shut down for selling books against the government. Finally, he could be at peace. He hailed the trolley lady over to him and purchased a sandwich for lunch. He took his time with it as he looked out at the familiar tundra he had long recognized as his home. After the Federation united Russia and President Shushk Shukshin proclaimed the Russian Federation, the fireworks went off and everyone from Siberian East to European West had celebrated. He thought that it was finally over. He had been sitting in his armchair one afternoon. After a day's work in construction, when he had heard on the home radio the long-awaited public announcement from the President, the President shocked the world, proclaiming that the time of true reunification was approaching. Those words piqued Volody's interest. The president went on, on to claim, or proclaim, in that speech that Moscow is roughly part of the Russian Federation as any oblast could be. The president called for all strong sons of Russia to step forward and aid in the true reunification of the motherland. He answered the call for the Federation and the skies belong to Russia. If we're to win the war on the ground, we must ensure the skies are under the complete and total domination of the Russian Air Force. With the several advancements made in technological development, and the overall of our air doctrine under the guidance of Alexander Pokrushkin, our Air Force has the strength to stand up to the Luftwaffe and be a true force of the skies we reckon with. Our president and a falcon. Oh, China modernizes. Very good. All right. The former president of the Federation strode into Shukshin's brand new office overlooking the mighty Alb River. Basil, uh, President Shukshin, what did you call me for into your office? Um, the Siberian Falcon asked carefully. The president of the Federation waved his hand dismissively. Call me Vasily. We're old friends. There's no need for pleasantries. Please take a seat. But Krishkin hesitated for a moment before slowly nodding and sitting down. I called you here because, as you know, we'll be going to war with the Germans once... Uh, we to take Moscow, retake it. But Krishkin's eyes practically bulged out of his sockets. Soon, we just reunited Russia, and with your recent reforms, the nation's nowhere stable enough to. He spluttered at a loss for words. Cheer up, you old corporation lover. Shukshin grinned, slapping a hand on the falcon shoulder. I'll be with too much force as the older man wins. I've done the numbers already, with some reforms to our industry and our military. We'll be more than ready to retake Vladivostok in Moscow. The falcon started, stared at the rider, clearly unconvinced. Vasily sighed, standing up and looking out the window. The people are getting restless, Shukshin explained. We have to retake our lost territory soon, or our united Russia without Russians is pointless. But Krishkin sighed, nodding his head reluctantly. All right, what can I help with? With something the Siberian Falcon knows best, Shukshin handed him a file detailing plans to update the Federation's air doctrines to best the updated Luftwaffe in the skies. I want you to lead the creation of the Federation's new air doctrine. I'm trusting you with this, Alexander. I think you'll make the Federation proud. Shukshin smiled. But Krishkin studied the paper before nodding. Of course, Vasily. I'll see what I can do. V. Destination. The train was nearly at its destination. The snow had cleared ahead of him, revealing the city of Samari ahead of him, where he would join his compatriots in all the, of the all-Russian army. Back home in Tomsk, his wife hadn't approved, but he was adamant. She knew him well, and perhaps she would have to convince him to stay, but she didn't press. She told him she, he had a promise to write, and he accepted after at that. He remembered something. He had given him a letter and told him to open it when he left the station, but he had forgotten to do so. He withdrew the letter from his jacket pocket and broke the wax seal. In his wife's ornate handwriting with a small greeting, I wish for him to pray to Christ as something he had not expected. I'll pray for your safety, dearest, and your protection, and I want I want to tell you something to give you hope, to give you strength. I would have told you on that day, but I knew it would, it would keep you by me, and that you have regretted it for the rest of your life. I urge you to continue your journey. Our second son's name shall be Alexander. Volody gritted his teeth as the train finally stopped. He stood up and looked towards the west, a look of determination in his eyes. He had another son on the way, one that he could not allow to grow up without a father. He needed to get home, but before he could do that, there was something he had to do for the good of his family and his country. Russia will be whole once again. And we are forced, basically, to do this. Spend all the political power this way. Oh, my goodness. Strength in numbers, and people are not going to like this. Oh, we're going to lose even more support. We can't do that yet. Oh, my goodness. We can't do anything here yet. I don't want to do this one yet, because we're going to lose political power anyways. And lose even more seats. We I, we literally can't do that yet. As much as I want to get more seats right now, I don't want to lose any more political power. We have to get as much political power right now as possible. As much as I want to do this, we can't afford to do that either. Oh, my goodness. This sucks. Um, We're building up nothing but military factories. Uh, not military factories, but... Like, as you can see... Uh, uh, forts, forts, forts. Why can't I think of the word forts? Oh my goodness. 
This is a lot more detail than the normal Second West Russian War with another unifier currently. So at the time of this recording, like most of the other unifiers can just go ahead and fight someone else. But like for us, here this is a lot more than I thought what would happen. So let's try to use this. I've never used this before in uh, TNO. It's going to be pretty costly to make, but that's alright. We've got plenty of guns. We can spare five there. We've got plenty of artillery. We can spare five there too. How many do we make a day? That's not going to be enough. Um, I might actually duplicate this one. Actually, no. They're not even 40 count with it. Flight of the Aviator. Bokrush can saunter towards a sleek flying machine. Sunlight glinting off its polished metal wings. A proud smirk on his face. What do you think, Vasily? It's beautiful, isn't it? The Aviator asked. Not corporate made, that's for sure. The president quipped as he followed closely behind the experienced pilot. <clears throat> the Federation recently released a new batch of combat planes, and Pokrushkin would be the one to f try them out. Alexander had a massive grin as he soared through the skies in the Federation's newest generation of jet fighter, the MIG-23, an aircraft with enough speed and firepower to challenge Luftwaffe in the skies. How's the weather up there? Sh Shukshin asked at, through Pokrushkin's headset. It's fine, Vasily. Ah, I've been away from the skies for far too long, Alexander exclaimed as he nosedived, performing several barrel rolls before pulling back up. What do you think, old friend? Is it fast enough to win us the skies? Vasily, with an aircraft like this, we could take over the world if we wanted. Pokrushkin replies as he looked below the clouds of the vast plains and numerous rivers of his homeland. He imagined Vasily grinning like an idiot as he pushed the aircraft to go even faster, creating a powerful sound that cracked the skies and propelled him forward. And a sonic boom roared throughout all of Novosibirsk and Russia. Now, right now, technically, we... I don't think there's any penalty if we don't do a focus. I could be very wrong. So we have to do everything else before we get the Vladivostok. So I think I'm actually going to wait here first, because we, we just need political power. Like, holy crap. Like, to even do anything here? So we can, if we do this, we get 25% more political power, which is nice. Yeah, we definitely need more political power, because we need core stuff. We need to do stuff. And I don't want to lose any more political power. Um, How are we doing here? You know what? We're not going to do anything yet. The Germans are making a bigger army. I mean, at this point, like I think they're pretty much done and stacked. So, now that we got this, we should be able to do another effort, right? No? Okay, let's score something then. TMM. There you go. Let's get some research done, too. Um, that's all done, which is nice. Uh, provide air support for units. Close air support. I like that, actually, a lot. Yeah, we're going to do this one. Air parity. We're not going to go air supremacy, because that's like helicopter stuff and like tactical bomber, strategic bomber stuff, so... Air superiority, uh, local dominance, interceptors, fighters, yeah, we're going to go with CAS, battlefield support, that's the way to go for now. Uh, since we're here, I'm just waiting to see if we can get any more stuff here, because we definitely need to do this. What happens if we do this? You know, I want to see. Do we lose anything? Do we lose, we might lose support here, maybe. Oh, I should have checked, 70% is pretty good, though. Hey, if you want to read about the second decrease in poverty for this campaign, please go right ahead. So now we get 2.14, oh, wait, nice. Um, did that help us at all? Um, political interference, political concessions, plus 10%. So it wasn't really that much, so. We gotta wait. Alright. Early, oh my gosh, we still have only early cast. Oh, that sucks. I guess I'm approved jet cast. And planes don't matter for now. Artillery, might as well grab the next thing, maybe? No, 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 that's way too at a time. Extra tanks are super, super good. Uh, oh, we got logistics as well. Nice, go ahead and integrate that place. Thank you. Gotta keep spending money, unfortunately. Hey, we're looking a little better, though, right now. Not bad, let time go on. Get some better stuff here. Uh, maintenance? Sure, why not? And... State Duma? Yeah. Because we're so... We're bare, we're so even here, which sucks. That sucks so much. But since we're not doing any focuses, we're gonna actually be able to quarry a lot more stuff here, so... Nice. Actually, just get that one, too. Improved heavy art. Actually, political concessions. Oh, wow. Now we only get... Yeah, so we get 0.3 more, which is okay. So this one gave us 80 soft attack. This one gives us 104. And the speed goes up a little bit more? Oh, that's so, that's so good. Or we can do this one. 52. I mean, that's not enough soft attack. I like we, I like a lot of soft attack. Go do that one, too. Sell more factories. That'll be good. Um, yeah, we've already got, we got a lot of stuff here already. Like, tons of air bases, because we're going to flat out need them. Get a lot of anti-air. You never know how badly the Germans are going to bomb the crap out of us, which I don't think is going to bomb us that badly, but still, you never know. Cool. Cool. All right. And I don't want to forget about this, too. I did forget about this. Just just a wee bit. Just a wee bit. We'll get all that stuff done. Nice. Still no manpower, but basically 80 million people is probably not, honestly, not going to be enough. Poverty rate's not bad, and we did get that better poverty thing, so, so yeah, it's not too bad either. 9.2% is not too bad. Um, political interference is not going to increase too much. Yeah. 
Huh? So, what was that? 108 on agriculture. We're already literally done with agriculture. So, as much as I want to call Corellia. Nice. There you go. How did they get up to... Oh, man, that was really bad. Political concessions really hurt us there. So, yeah, don't do political concessions, kids. You definitely don't do that. Don't you? That, that is just going to help us out. Core more stuff. Just core, 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 core. So, I think... Alright, so... Oh, well, hold on. Let's get more technology done first. A little bit ahead of time. So, we're pretty much done. Oh, never mind. I lied. With that for now. So, we're, this is what we're going to do. Um, a new federation. I don't think I've read this one yet. After many drafts and much discussion amongst the members of the Duma, a new federal constitution has been created for the federation. A new constitution that protects each and every lawful citizen right, rights to the freedom of speech, to assemble peacefully, and to live freely without needing to worry about the government. Naturally, the Silovics are outraged at this, as it would essentially eliminate any chance they had over the federation with them in the minority. There is little they can do to stop them from passing. For the first time in who knows how long, the Russian people shall finally know true freedom. <sighs> That's going to hurt us. I mm, Go ahead and do it once. We'll do the, this one immediately first, but... Yeah, I don't know. We don't just don't have enough political power, in my opinion. I mean, I could be very wrong. Like, I, I could become I could be completely dead wrong, but, you know, whatever. Um, five a day. Basic heavies. I feel like we need more. Especially since I want to use a lot more tanks. So go down a little bit more. Artillery's okay. We're going to need a few more APCs. We got a lot of advanced tanks. Holy crap. Since we're here together, anyways. Oh, we got some jet casts, which is nice. Some even better jet casts. Whole, how do they keep? Wait, how do they keep getting more and more and more and more and more? Am I gonna do be forced to use political, like cheats here to get enough political power? Like I don't want to do that, but like I will if I have to. That seems very unfair, man. So unfair. A drink between friends. Vasily stared at the final draft of the Federation's new constitution with a warm smile on his face. The Federal Assembly had just voted on it, and despite the protests of the Siloviki, the new constitution had been passed with flying colors. There was a knock at Shushkin's door, Shushkin's door, and then standing was Alexander Pokrushkin with the two glasses in one hand and a bottle of vodka in the other. May I come in? Alexander asked. Shushkin nodded and signaled for his old friend to enter his office. Alexander did so, taking a set, a seat, and placing the items on the present desk. What brings you here, Alexander? Vasily asked the aviator. I thought I'd come by and share a drink with you, old friend. But Krishkin replies he poured a reasonable amount of alcohol in each glass. Why, well, I'm glad you came, Alexander, but last time I checked, you were against a new constitution. The writer inquired as he took the glass. I'm not pleased about it, but I must admit that this is not about my defeat, but your victory. Alexander replies he reached for this glass. Besides, what kind of friend would I be if I didn't support your achievement tonight? Vasily smiles and raises his glass in the air. To better days, my friend, the writer spoke. Pokrushkin was silent for a moment before raising his own glass with a smile. To better days, President Shukshin, and then the Russian dream, which is going to hurt us even for more little power, my god. When the Soviet Union fell all those years ago, many believed that the dream of Russia fell with it, too. The promises of prosperity made by Pokharin fell to places or pieces with the fall of Moscow and the failures of the West Russian Revolutionary Front. Things are different now, though. On the streets, whispers of hope could be heard every day. Thousands of Russians were escaping poverty and reaching prosperity. New businesses were opening across the nation. With the conclusion of the National Reformation, the people of the Russian Federation have finally achieved the very thing President Shukshin had long promised since his inauguration, the Russian dream. Which, oh my god, we don't have enough political power. Go and grab that stuff. Yeah, go, just go and grab both. Oh, we don't have helicopters, but whatever. We'll get it done anyways. A new dawn. Nikolai had to blink uh, back tears. He didn't believe it. Since the days of the Soviet Union, he had never felt anything but despair. His life had been constant suffering. His, he lost his father in Moscow, his mother and little brother to succumb to hunger while his sister had been worked to death in the factories of Perm, making bullets for the Nazi dudes. And while all the while, he barely stayed alive by living off the wilderness. As one of Russia's many warlords vying for power finally managed to unite Western Russia, he was employed at a lowly factory worker, working long shifts in a dangerous condition to get the bare minimum to eat. No matter how many times Perm changed hands in the ensuing wars, he remained poor, depressed, and sick, seemingly destined for a life of nothing but torment. But all the pain would end tomorrow. Just as he lost all hope in his life, he heard the news. The current ruler of the West Russia, he had surrendered to the Siberian Federation, reuni reunifying the Russian nation after three decades of division. At first, he hadn't been optimistic, but soon he realized that President Shukshin was trying to change the Federation for the better. As time passed, his hour work hours got shorter, his wages got higher, and the government was actually putting people ahead of profit. And with the passing of the Voting Rights Act, he could vote for the first time. The beaten and broken young man could envision a bright future, one better than toiling in the factories or dying on the front lines. For once, he could dream of a better life. And like so many others, he dreamt. Okay, so now we get slightly more political power, a lot more the population stability construction speed which is nice it's not enough but we're done with integrating places which i mean we've lost in a million that's not core here but we still don't have enough manpower which sucks not the mod's fault like i would just say that there um it's not going to be good <laughs> yeah oh boy let's look at this 40 oh my god 44. how do we get more support instead of just waiting for political power like, that's all we can literally do. So, making political concessions is not worth it. Um, 
I think really the only thing that we can really do here is I'm just going to spend some time off screen making things better, improving ourselves, getting ready for the war. So we did that one. Um, when we get enough support, I will do the West Russian plan so we can improve fa faster. So I read this one already. And then national education reform, which you do give more, more taxable population. It's going to cost a little bit more, but that's okay. So um, I think I read this one. Uh, for decades, the Russian education system has been in shambles. Many schools across the nation have been reducing mere indoctrination camps for the various warlords, teaching very little about their motherland and the world beyond. The Russian people deserve an education system that offers useful skills that will help them in life and not turn, not turning our impressionable youth into ideologic fanatics. And so because there's going to be a, quite a bit of time difference between now and then, I'll see you in a little bit when we have a similar focuses finished. Hope in the West, an old man walked quietly down the street of his native Perm. He had witnessed much in his life, the fall of the Union, the collapse of the Front, the downfall of Perm, and the rise of the Hitlerites under Wagner for years. He could only weep as he stared up at the ruined buildings to see the dreaded banner bearing the swastika flying above their heads. The old man kept to himself, avoiding the German worshippers as much as he could. After witnessing so much pain in his life, he thought he could never know happiness again. So, when he heard that the Federation taking control of Perm and proclaimed the establishment of the Russian Federation, for the first time since his childhood, the old man had been truly happy. He joined the crowd that flocked the streets, celebrating the reformation of the Russian nation. Things did get better as time went on. Development was occurring across Perm as fear of the Brotherhood faded into memory. It seemed his native city was discovering itself once more. He heard news that the president himself was visiting his home city, wanting to see just how much things had changed. The old man found himself in a crowd of people, all awaiting the arrival of the president, and soon enough, a motorcade of black vehicles had arrived, and out stepped their beloved president. Waving to the crowd, the president approached, offering handshakes and exchanging words personally. Soon the president stood before him. The old man looked on in wonder of as Shukshin extended his hand. The old man reached out, gladly taking the president's hand and shaking it vigorously. The old man looked up at the president, tears in his eyes and a smile on his face as the man who saved Russia smiled back. As the handshake eventually broke, the old man uttered some words to the president before he would leave and address the people of his city. Thank you, President Shukshin. Thank you for saving all of us. As we're doing the national uh, education reform and strength in numbers, which is going to lose their support, which sucks. But the all-Russian army is a strong, modern, expert force that has proven far superior to the former Soviet Red Army. The battles they fought in the reunification of the motherland has proven that they are experienced force that ought to be feared by the armies that occupy our native Moscow. But if there's one thing that former Red Army had, had that the all-Russian army does not, is numbers. If the Russian Federation does stand strong against the occupiers and push them back to their native lands, we must and we require greater numbers on the fields to match the strength of their armies. And we're going to lose just a lot of stuff. But we do have, more hopefully, more strength now. So, nice. Other Tomsk State University. Natalie had tears in her eyes as she gazed upon the place she had called or dreamed of ever going to since the 7th grade, Tomsk University, State University. Throughout her time in high school, uh, she studied hard, hoping to one day be accepted into one of Russia's only surviving universities, even the fall of Tomsk and the integration of the CSR into the Federation. This did not deter Natalie from striving to her dreams. However, when she graduated from high school and applied to the university, her heart shattered when she received a rejection letter. The Federation did not allow women in universities. Natalie had been relegated to work in a factory in the factory city of Novosibirsk, earning what she could just to get by. As the Federation United Siberia, it seemed pointless to expect change to come until election day when everything changed. She remembered crying tears of joy when it was announced that her idol, the writer Vasily Shukshin, had finally dethroned Alexander Pokrushkin. When Russia finally united, change was cut coming quick. People were freer than ever before. The concerns of everyday workers were finally being answered. The corporations were beaten back. Women could vote once more. Her life then changed once more as she had one day received a letter from the Tomsk State University. They apologized for their unfair treatment of her, despite her being highly qualified to attend. To compensate her for the university's actions under Pokrishkin's government, they had offered her a chance to return to her home city of Tomsk and finally be able to attend the best university in all of Russia. She smiled with glee as she took her first step towards the university's administrative building, preparing for a brighter life that awaited her. A dream realized after so long and a duty to the Federation. A professional and loyal army, strong in army, capable of defeating any and all enemies in his path. We will remind our soldiers for what they are fighting for. They do not serve the ruling elites of Russia. Their duty is to the Federation and the millions that call this land home. So we lose attack, like I said last time, but we do get some more attack. Our more army professionals, which is really, really, really quite good to get. Uh, we're we'll doing some stealth technology, which doesn't really matter too much, but hey, we got it anyways because we can. And we got to start planning for the next five years so we can build some more stuff up because land ports are great and all, but yeah. I decided to build... Oh, wow. Look at all the land forts we built. Holy crap. That's a lot of land forts. But with this extra time... Like, it's good that we have this time just so we can get our air and life option done. So, I got some more tanks. And actually, I decided to convert some of these guys over to tank divisions too. But they're actually with SP artillery. Which overall, like... Uh, I don't know. SP artillery, like, this is our normal tank division. It has a little less than 1,500 soft attack. Armor is 185. Organization is almost 26. So, but th these guys... Their SP artillery is already pretty similar. They have less armor and a little bit less organization, maybe even slightly less HP. So I'm not really sure if there's really if this is any better or not. Defense or breakthroughs 
2166. Well, the breakthrough over here is 3300. So is there really any point to get these guys? I mean, yeah, I like the boost to small, small boost to soft attack, but is there any point to using them? But, new recruits. Let me observe the recruits standing shoulder to shoulder, uh, remaining quiet as he sized them up. <clears throat> A new batch wasn't much to look at, but this was to be expected with an all-Russian army loosening its standards. Vladimir understood why this was done. President Shushkin was on the warpath, his eyes focused on the old capital, Moscow, and the Federation would need as many troops as it could muster if they were to repel the Wehrmacht from Eastern Europe. That didn't mean he had to like training the next generation of Russian soldiers for the next few years, though. My name is Vladimir Orlov. You refer to me as either Sergeant Orlov or just Sergeant. Throughout your training, you will learn how to fire various types of weaponry, how to work together as a combat team on the ground, and how to survive on the battlefield. No matter what you... No matter what, you are to not you are to obey not only my orders but the orders of all your superiors during your time in this army. Do I make myself clear? Yes, Sergeant. The recruits all answered in unison. Vladimir nodded before turning to a long table that was lined with standard issue AKM rifles. I want each of you to take a rifle from the table and proceed to the firing range. I want to see how your aim is. Don't bother fighting over the guns. There's one for each of you, all the exact same. Vladimir ordered, and the recruits obeyed, grabbing a rifle and proceeding to the firing range as instructed. Vladimir watched with fit, then fiddled with the rifles for a moment before sighing to himself. Let's get to work and the issue of livestock. When the old Soviet Union collapsed, the Japanese Empire was swift in seizing the city of Vladivostok and portions of the Far East from the collapsing Soviet government. At the time, the Russian people were powerless to stop the Imperial Army from marching into the lands. To most, including many Russians, Vladivostok was seen forever out of reach until now. With the, all, with the Russian Federation united and stronger than ever, the present feels that the time has come to finally turn the attention of the nation back towards the East and address the issue of our occupied Far Eastern lands. Nice. Got some of that too. The issue of Vladivostok. Alright, I'm not sure we really need these guys over here. And we are making more divisions, don't get me wrong, but... You never know. Oh, this sacred note. The Ivan had always wanted to be a soldier. He was yet born to defend the motherland against the Nazi invaders, and he was too young to join the front during the West Russian War. Yet, Ivan had so heard rumors, or numerous stories, of the untold millions who gave their lives to fight for the motherland. Although the face of the motherland had changed over the years, his determination had never wavered. Thus, on his 18th birthday, Ivan decided to, to, to dedicate his life to the liberation of the Russian people, and enlisted in the army on the day of his induction. Ivan and 999 other brave young men rose their right hand to the forehead and proudly announced their loyalty to the new Russian state. To Ivan, no greater words had ever been spoken. I, as a citizen of the Russian Federation, entering into the ranks of the all-Russian army, take this oath and solemnly promise to do an honest, to be an honest, brave, vigilant fighter and defend the Russian people against all who would seek to subjugate them. I'm always prepared to rise to the defense of my motherland, to defend it bravely, skillfully, with dignity and honor, sparing neither my blood nor my life itself for the achievement of total victory over our enemies. Those words would ring throughout the minds of the rest of his life. At that moment, a tear rolled down his cheek. It was his turn to set Russia free. And also, we did get to a single weapon over here, so, yeah. Other than that, not, not much else has really happened on screen, but... Petition to America. The U.S. of A. Ever since the Second Russian War, the Americans have been there to help the Russian people in their time of need for decades. They've stood as a beacon of hope and liberty in a world strife with tyranny and oppression. Russia and America share much in common, a commitment to democracy and shared enemies in both Germany and Japan. The Americans know what it's like to have a part of their land under the subjugation of a foreign power, to have your land ripped away by the opportunistic Japanese Empire, where the Russian Federation is re-establishing its claims to Ottoman Manchuria. The President is calling upon America once more to support our just claims and to motivate the Japanese to return our lands to the rightful government. The Falcon's Proposal. Shushkin drummed his hands on the table impatiently as he waited for Pokushkin to arrive, with the Russian Federation reform to prepare for what's ahead. Vasily felt the nation was finally ready to address the matter of Vladivostok. A city built by Russian hands, stolen away by the Japanese during the collapse of the former Soviet Union. Could he do it? Could he pull off a negotiation with a superpower? Its popularity would skyrocket if they could retake the Far Eastern lands, but if they were to fall on this endeavor, the increasingly anxious president ran a hand through his hair, sifting through the possibilities in his head. Right on cue, Pokushkin entered his office. Acknowledging the ace's presence with a nod, the rider gestured to the empty seat for Pokushkin to take. You know why I called you here, Alexander. We can't ignore Vladivostok. The falcon nodded, placing several files down in his desk. I've spoken with some of my colleagues, and we've come up with new proposals in dealing with Japanese, he explained, as Shukshin took a folder and opened it. Most of our solutions involve a Japanese learning economic treaty, leading economic treaty, that lasts for the next couple of years. We could allow those Ibatsus to set up shop in China, Chita, and Magadan for researchers so we can get investments from them to help develop the Far East in addition to Vladivostok. Alternatively, we could offer them support through the current oil crisis. Shukin nodded, grabbing the folder that covered the option. The idea is to make the Japanese see us as equals as well as give them a deal they can't refuse. This one, the pilot gestured to the folder in his hands with a grin on his face, gives them a deal they literally can't reject. And to the outside world, it'll look like, a J like Japan, a global superpower, is on their hands and knees begging us for oil. The Rider smiles as he set the file on his desk. The Lord of the Far East shall be ours once again. Oh, did they have supply issues? Um, you know, unable to move to a province along his path. Yeah, no, you're fine. Alright, so. Four more divisions. Do we have enough? Yeah. And we'll get some more 10,000 manpower back, which is nice, but it's not going to be enough, but whatever. Petition to America. 
military march in Novosibirsk. Although we do not see conflict with the Empire of Japan, the Federation must show to them in the globe that Russia is no longer plagued by the weaknesses of the old Soviet Union. We are rapidly modernizing a militarily powerful nation capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the globe's largest superpower. General Dmitry Glinka has recommended that in order to march to further intimidate the Japanese, we should march the all-Russian army down the streets of Novosibirsk, similar to the parades once held in the Red Square of Moscow. Nice. And since we're here, we don't really need this probably too much more, but State Duma, thank you. And the people are supportive of us, which is nice. Contact the Russian partisans. For decades, the Russian partisans in Ottoman Manchuria, particularly the Berobidzan Oblast, have fought tirelessly and valiantly against their Japanese oppressors in a long effort for freedom. With the reunification of Russia, their efforts will have only intensified as they now fight to rejoin their motherland. With the Federation now aiming to retake the occupied city of Vladivostok, perhaps now would be the perfect time to reach out to these partisan groups and better coordinate and supply their efforts against the Manchurian and Japanese authorities in the region. The Eastward March. Oh, look at that, the Russian dream. Shoulder to shoulder, marching proudly, their faces looking towards the presidential palace as the bands played songs of praise to the army and the motherland. Rows of infantry hold their weapons forward, boots hitting the ground in sync in perfect formation, the lines and lines of trucks carrying patriotic soldiers standing in attention, their bodies as rigid as a column of steel beasts that follow them behind. The newest batch of Russian made tanks rumbles past, their armor shining beneath the sun, countable account uncountable counts. Amounts of artillery hog the sides of men, they haul them along as a cavalry division trots by, holding their bayonets up to the sky. Shushkin gaze upon the never-ending uh, lines of soldiers from the balcony and felt raw emotions tug at his heartstrings. Pride. Pride of the new federation he had built. Now a beacon of hope in this godforsaken world, a bit of confidence maybe. This parade was barely a fraction of the federation's actual army, which had become a force capable of standing up to the armies of Germany and Japan, but above all, of these emotions, uncertainty. Uncertainty about the future. Would the negotiations with Japan fail? Could they beat back the Germans? What if they couldn't liberate Moscow? What if they lost Shushkin? Shushkin. Shukshin was snapped out of his thoughts by a firm hand on his back. He looked over his shoulder and saw the concerned faces of not only his cabinet, but Pokrushkin as well. His eyebrows raised with a look of concern in his eyes. Look below, Vasily. They're all marching for you, and you're wallowing in your depression. I believe you didn't come this far to fail. This should be one of the proudest moments of your life. So act like it. The strong man practically yelled at him. Shukshin shot, uh, slowly turned around, nodding. I guess you're right. You must really have faith in our nation. Faith in yourself, my friend. Do you remember the oath we made all those years ago? Have you forgotten what we swore to that day that we broke from the Central Siberian Republic? No matter the struggles ahead, no matter the enemies we face in the coming storm, we will free your people no matter the cost and tell them to raise heck. The partisans in Antomachuria have been ra uh, rallied behind the Russian Federation and are prepared to fight hard to rejoin their motherland in Karbarovsk, Karbarovsk and Vladivostok. Rebels under the guidance of our agents of the Zuzba Besopastinosti are ready to raid Imperial military facilities with all the pieces in place now. Shukshin is prepared to give them the order. Give them heck, boys. Give them, give them a lot of heck. Ooh, people's support goes down. Alliance in the woods. And let's just want first anyway, since we want to lose support anyways. So, uh, Dimitri slowly approached an isolated shack located deep within the forest of Berodbizan, just north of the city of the same name. After some investigating and some advanced questioning, he had learned that the former resistance leader lived quietly. Halt! Not one step further, an old voice spoke from within the trees. Dimitri searched around the forest before his eyes settled on the old man sitting from afar with a rifle in his hands. Are you the one roughing people up, seeking to find me? The old man asked. I am. My name is Dimitri Ivanov. Shushba Bezopasnosti. On behalf of President Shukshin. I'm here to see you, Peter. Uh, Dimitri replied, hands raised to show he meant no harm. Peter lowered his rifle as he eyed Dimitri. I've heard of you. You've done plenty of bad things. Russia's monster. I tell me, what brings you here? Peter asked as Dimitri approached your man. President Shukshin wants you to rally your old comrades in arms. Cause as much tro trouble and chaos as you can. The president aims to retake Barrow's Bizan and believes that they're starting the resident resistance. will make the Japanese more open to negotiation with the Federation, Dimitri explained. <clears throat> oh, uh, the, uh, finally lowering his hands. President Shukshin, he's so fixated on Moscow these days, I must admit I'm surprised he's even interested in Beryl Bizan. Peter replied, shocking, shocked at the news. Peter turned away from Dmitri, thinking to himself for a moment. When Russia shattered, his resistance had lef been left to fend for themselves before the Japanese finally broke them in Kabar, Kabarovsk. Now the president of his homeland, reunited, wants him to jump into the fray. Peter lost many of his brothers and sisters in arms in their impossible mission to free Amur Basin from Japanese rule, and it amounted to nothing. But that was without a strong Russia to support them. Perhaps this time there would finally be a chance of success. Maybe there's a chance that he could finally do what he'd always wanted to do, liberate his fellow Russians. Peter sighed as he turned around to see and face Dmitri. Consider the Russian resistance reborn, and approach the sphere. With the uncontrollable chaos erupting throughout Outer Manchuria, and the rising tension between the Federation and the co-prosperity sphere over the disputed territory, perhaps now is the time to bury the hatchet with the Japanese, and discuss the fate of Vladivostok, and of course, the Far East. A message from Russia's monster to Peter, redacted. Redacted, Berbidzan Oblast. 
your forces have been equipped sufficiently for the task ahead. With negotiations for the Far East approaching, the time has come to cause as much chaos as your partisans can against the Japanese and Manchurian uh, military personnel. You're ordered to raid Japanese military bases, sabotage railways, and create unrest amongst the general population. Notice, you are under no circumstances are permitted to intentionally harm any unarmed civilian you may come across during your assignment. Ah, our targets are strictly military, not civilian. If you or any of the members of your organization intentionally break these guid guidelines, I will personally handle the problem from redacted. Unleash your chaos and give your occupiers heck once more. And then, the bane of the nation. Oh, look at this. With the issue of the Far East finally resolved, it is time to return our attention back to the West. For years, an illegitimate state of Muscovine stands as a symbol of Russia's greatest failure. Shukhin knows that there is no peaceful way of Moscow returning to the Russian Federation. If Russia is to ever be truly united and free from the forces of tyranny, President Shukhin must prepare the nation for what very might well be Russia's last war. Awesome, awesome, possum. We want even more soft attack, so... It does go up a little bit more, but it's still... I don't know if I can justify the cost for that, you know? Keep training if you need to. We need to have the best tip-top military ever. The issue of Bero Bidzan. The Bero Bidzan Oblast has been the source of a partisan movement in Ottomanchuria, who has been battling the Japanese occupation for the homeland since the illegal annexation in the late 40s. The land is majority Russian province, who only wishes to return to the warm embrace of their motherland. With the return of Bero Bidzan, a large chunk of the Russian partisan movement would go along with it. I'm sure they'd be happy to have it off their hands, of course, and approach the sphere. After several weeks of chaos in outer Manchuria, and growing tension between the Russian Federation and Dai Nippon Taikoku, the Japanese have finally approached a government and have asked that we meet in the city of Beijing to discuss the future of outer Manchuria. With the government eager to regain the occupied uh, far east from the Japanese, we have agreed to let meet them and have sent our top diplomats to negotiate with the Japanese. Let's begin. We'll give them whatever they want. Ah, if you want to that, please go ahead. Let the negotiations begin. But happy 1975, everyone. Hope you're having a tremendous year. A tr truly tremendous new year. No matter how many cities they built, we always have one heck of a deficit, which is just painfully hurting me. Uh, actually, you no, know, well, let's grab some synthetic refiners. Even though we don't really need them that much. We have quite a few uh, things operating. Tanks. They were agreed to turn Barrel Bizon. As many had expected, the Japanese agreed to peacefully return the Barrel Bizon Oblast, stating that it would be in the best interest to do so. With the issue of Barrel Bizon now concluded, we are presented with two more options. We could end the negotiations here, perhaps we could test our luck and see if we can retake the city, uh, the next city. Yes. We'll give them whatever they want. We need it. Actually, quick. Uh, also, like we got everything else done, so they have promised compromise. Unlike Barrel Bizan, Japan is not as eager to hand over Ka Kabarovsk. They have instead proposed a deal. In exchange for handing over Kabarovsk, they have asked for them to maintain the resource rights in Armature and gain access to the tungsten reserves of the Mag Magna Oblast. Fine. They must see our tanks. And motorized. They, they agree. After some negotiations, they've agreed to return uh, K and Outer Manchuria to the uh, Russian Federation. Our diplomats have celebrated the victory as much as what was stolen by the Japanese would now be peacefully returning to Russia where it belongs. Now about Vladivostok. Honestly, we probably don't even need these guys here. They propose a compromise after some thought the Japanese diplomats have proposed. That the Russian Federation compromise they find reasonable. Japan, of course, still is going through an oil crisis that has handicapped their economy for some time. In exchange for the return of Vladivostok, the Japanese are asking for access to the Siberian oil reserves to support their economy as well as safe passage of the Congo residents to Manchuria. Nice. And they agree to return Vladivostok. After days of tense silence from the Japanese diplomats, the Japanese have agreed to return the city, port city of Vladivostok back to the Russian Federation. The news has been celebrated by our government as our nation's goals in the Far East have finally been achieved. A victory for the motherland. Yay! Because I'm ready to court, because we it's not a lot of manpower, but we, we need it. We absolutely need this. The Republic of China do be looking kind of nice, though. Treaty of Beijing, with the negotiations now concluded. The time has come to sign the Treaty of Beijing. Through peaceful means, we've achieved our goals and retaken the occupied Far East. With the signing of the treaty, we'll see its reintegration into the Russian Federation. And our uh, millions across Russia have gathered on the streets in celebration and are eagerly waiting to welcome our Russian brothers and sisters back into the warm embrace of our glorious motherland. A victory for the Russian Federation. The Far East reintegration zone will be integrated. Oh! Let's go and integrate this area first. At least that's some more manpower. And then, oh, we have more focuses. Look at that. Ivan Tsarov, you're my general. You don't have a focus sheet, but that's actually really awesome. That's actually really cool. Congo emigration, huh? That's actually really cool to see. But, I guess, the bane of the nation. Oh boy, is this it? 
Or is this where we... Nice. A oh, wrong writing. Oh, if you're wondering about the crocodile partial success, please go ahead. Time for an aerial blitz. Not bad. Oh, do we need focus? Ooh, the plan. The presence called all Pokrushkin and all military leaders across the Federation to return to Novus Obirsk and convene in the war room to plan the Federation strategy in the upcoming war against the German Reich and what preparations the all-Russian army needs to make before we can begin the liberation of Eastern Europe from Nazi tyranny. Nice. Let's keep working on this stuff, too. And then... Send in the Slobza Beso Pastnosti. But Krushkin has made it clear to the President that if we were to liberate our sacred Moscow from the Nazi occupiers and repel them from our lands, the best course of action would be to send in the agents of the Slobza Beso Pastnosti behind enemy lines to gather intelligence and weakening Reichskommissar Muscovine from within the meeting. Shushkin had gathered the others in his office for an important meeting, quite possibly the most important one in a very long time. They had already decided that an invasion of Germany would be the only way to reclaim Moscow, but now they had to answer without another question. How? The Wehrmacht was the strongest land force on the planet Earth, and although the oil crust has definitely devastated the German army, they would still be far from a morsel. The Federation could just gobble up, contrary to what many of the proud officials thought, in what could be Russia's final chance against the Hun, there was no room for error. The Falcon called for the Slusba, Bessel Pasnosti, to infiltrate Muscovine, and destabilize the already unstable colony. As the all-Russian army marches west, he proclaimed, partisans will lead the way, ripping up vital infrastructure and terrorizing the local garrisons, giving us advantage in a quick offensive. On the other hand, Novikov urges caution. To pray for a swift victory is dangerous. We must plan accordingly for this battle of attrition. Despite the old crisis, the panzer still remain deadly, and we will all surely remember how German tanks have ripped through Russia lines twice now. We must consider a strong defensive line where we can grind down their armies before we retaliate. But with slow and steady progress, we will win the war. Without a good strategy, the Federation will, of course, be hopeless. And right now, tank-wise, we're good. We're good. It's not bad. I'm going to convert things more over, so... Um, break their encryptions. Cracking the Muscovine encryptions will grant the all-Russian army unlimited access to all Nazi supply lines, battle tactics, and troop movements across Muscovine, giving us superior intelligence over out our enemy in the coming conflict against Einheit's Pact. Nice. Oh, we have not, we're not ready for that yet. Oh, my bad. <coughs> yeah, we don't have enough divisions yet. We just really do not. Uh, keep going to get more. Um, actually, Democratic Republic. Thank God Iran's not in the faction. Thank God. Norway is, which is bad, because these guys, are they our puppet? No, they're not. Actually, that's not bad then. So hopefully this is the only front we really have to worry about, which is good. But you never know. Oh, we didn't even get the next level of SP artillery? My bad. Uh, prepare the Western defenses. Uh, oh, we get a partial mobilization? We lose even more political power, but that's okay. Uh, Novikov has made it clear that he would be foolish, or it would be foolish, to not prepare any defenses for the war ahead. Our western border is vulnerable to German advance, lacking the necessary fortifications to halt a potential advance into our lands and the tracks. We must begin mobilizing the nation and prepare for war. What are we currently on? Uh, political laws. Do no, 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 no. Two year draft, which is not enough. We need to go four year draft. Well, we're on early. Mo we're on early mobilization, huh? Another late night. Crap, I'm I'm tired. Kira muttered. Want a coffee? I don't know if they have twenty sugars for you, but I can check. F off, John Smiles tiredly before replying. Let's try one more permutation. Then I'll see if Gregory can rustle up some food. Did they feed you this well? Th this well back in America? Kira asked. She sat down in the elderly office chair next to John as he continued typing into the computer. He scoffed. No, the CIA never dreamed of eating potatoes three times a day. Who knew it would be so good for my complexion? John said. Here, I want to try another variant of the Alice method. This time I'm programming the computer to execute chosen cipher text Delta with new orientation Maxim taught us last week. Maxim doesn't know crap. Effing uh, Tomsky, Kira said. Poor guy couldn't find his own two feet, and they weren't attached to him. Be polite, Kira Gor Gorkonova. No, Gorkonova. At least Maxim knows how to vote, John said. Do you think after the crap Russia went through under the Revolutionary Front, people like you would learn not to vote for Reds? He finished inputting his commands into the whirling computer and pressed the under key. Anyway, that'll be uh, a few minutes. Another round of poker, Kira asked. Maybe Svetlana can loan you some money. Oh, you think you didn't teach me how to bluff at the company? Three hours passed in semi-boredom. Kira had scooped up another winning hand and John's lunch money when the computer whirled into a halt. Crap, finally, Kira said. I'll get it. She limped over to the computer monitor, expecting that the intercepted German message would be a garbled mess, as always. Oh, crap, she said. What's wrong? Orders from Hauptmann Wagner. She read, trembling. Fighter Wing 107 to redeploy to Navigard Airfield by 1700 hours. Wait, we cracked it? And let's go ahead and do... Let's get these stuff first. And this broken stuff is nice, but build up the airfields. It won't matter how many MIG 23s and Yak 28 PPs the Federation has produced to face Luftwaffe. In the skies, we lack the airfields required to field our vast fleet. But Kurskin has recommended we expand the existing airfields in Russia as quickly as possible. If we lose a war in the air, we will lose a war, and we will lose it quickly. Doom foretold. Daniel was pouring concrete to form the base of a minor communications bunker when he began field. The sky was too wide, too blue, too sunny. Perfect flying conditions for a German fighter. The horizon was clear, and he knew the Federation Air Force was too powerful to allow the Luftwaffe to simply waltz into Russia and strafe him, but. 
Every time he turned his back, he could feel the bullet tripping through his skin. Wait, was that there? Oh, the whine of a diving airplane? A slightest breeze set him on edge. Danilo's hands began to tremble. He felt nauseous and weak, like he'd been deprived of food for a week, and then forced to run a marathon. His heart pounded out of his chest, and he couldn't get enough air. Why couldn't he breathe? Danilo doubled over, gasping for air. Sweat poured from his brow to his thick beard. He held out a hand to steady himself and collapsed into the dirt. Brother, brother, can you hear me? Someone was slapping him. How odd. You, call for an ambulance now. Who are you? Danilo croaked. I am Father Dimitri Panin, the unknown man said. Are you well, my son? Can you breathe? Danilo shook his head in, in, in the affirmative. His voice was barely a whisper. I, I couldn't. The sky? His voice showed off. Father Panin frowned. I understand, my son. The Lufafa was no kinder to the people of Gaini than your home, he said. But I see you in the same terror that affects all Russians. But do not despair. Christ is with you, and he will not allow his flock to come to harm. Danilo's eyes filled with tears. I'm afraid, Father. Father Panin simply nodded. I know, I am afraid too. Let me pray for you. He placed his right hand on Daniel's forehead, wiping away the sweat and muck that crowned him. Father Almighty, bless this man as he labors for the protection of others. Save him from the snares and temptations of Satan, and shield his back from all wounds and in iniquities. Make your presence known to him, and that he may be comforted by your love. In the distance, the whine of an ambulance grew louder. St. Dymphna, you great wonder worker in every affliction of mine, I humbly implore your intercession with Jesus through Mary in this hour, man's hour of need. Do not leave his side, Mata of Purity, patroness of the suffering. Pray to them for this man and obtain my request. Ora pro nobia, or nobis. Guard another flank. As we make our defensive preparations for the coming war with Germany, our advisors have pointed out one of the Federation's great weaknesses, the Barents Sea. The Germans will undoubtedly have naval superiority throughout the war, may use this advantage to exploit our northern weaknesses, to breach our northern coastline. We must take necessary measures to reinforce northern Russia and ensure that the Germans make no further uh, than the cold shores of Arkhangelsk. It's very smart to think about. It's a little bit ahead of time, I don't care though. <coughs> Excuse moi. Oh, my goodness. And lessons from Barbarossa about war in the skies. To win a modern war, one must control the skies. To control the skies, one must have fighters. To have fighters, one must have airfields, and so it shall be. If we were to win this war against Germany, we must win the war in the sky. As such, a major public work uh, project to rebuild the old airfields and upgrade current ones is now underway. The old Soviet Air Force, despite its immense size, was destroyed by the Luftwaffe in the Second World War and later in the West Russian War. We must not repeat the same mistakes they have made three times in a row. Already brave men have answered Mother Russia's call and joined the Air Force to bring glory to our land and freedom to our people. We shall dominate the skies. We shall crush the Germans. We shall free our people. We shall claim our land, and we shall bring justice to our comrades who died before. War is more than just the boots on the ground, but a combined effort. And lessons from Barbarossa. We have learned from the mistakes that have been made during Operation Barbarossa. The Wehrmacht has not changed since the West Russian War. We know what to expect, and more importantly, how to stop them in their tracks. We will not be caught off guard by the Germans again, but we're going to weaken their administration first. The Lorax Commissariat's hold on their territory is continuous at best, often battling partisans and rebels across the nation, primarily nearing our border. With the right men shot dead by our agents and certain individuals going missing, their weak administration will rapidly turn to dust, breaking any illusion of control they think they have over the occupied lands of Western Hasha. Good, good, good. The old man in the sea. I can't effing believe it, Private Sergei Korolkov said. I traveled all the way from Alexivka to stare at the effing ocean. Sergeant Barad Klimov merely grunted, the old man eating his sandwich, barely offering Private Korolkov any attention at all. You know, if the Germans do invade from the sea, we'll both be killed, Korolkov said. Our jobs are run before they land, kid. K Klimov grunted. I'm not a kid, I'm a man and a soldier of the Federation Army, Korolkov exclaimed loudly. And if those fascist dogs try to dare lay a foot upon my nation, so I'll shoot the dudes where they stand. Klimov shook his head. No, you lied about your age when you volunteered. No, I didn't. If you're a day over 15, I'll eat my head. I'm 19, Sergeant Klimov. Then tell me, Barakat asked. Which warlord controlled West Russia before the Federation invaded? Uh, Grigory Melenkov? Klimov shook his head. You're so full of crap, I can smell it on your breath. Klimov turned to face Private Kolokov. Sandwich dripping tomato juice into the sparse grass. When I fought for the West Siberian People's Republic, I was stationed in Zatos, this gang, the Aryan Brotherhood, Steve's Perm. A couple months later, they started testing our borders. A raid here, a feint here, an assassination there. I was reassigned to Lisva. But by the time I arrived, the Aryans had already captured the city. You know what they did? Private Kolokov shook his head no. They went through the city, rounded up everybody, cut their hands off. They let them to starve. You ever seen a two year old screaming for his parents with no effing hands? Sergei said nothing. His stomach had already turned upside down. The Germans did worse than that during the Great Patriotic War, uh, Sergeant Berakad said. Be thankful you won't have to see such things in your dreams, but they are broken. The Slobza, Be Pasnosti's final target are the officer corps of the Muscovy. Wiping out their most experienced and innovative military staff will cripple their ability to effectively fight our troops on the field and completely demoralize their pitiful auxiliaries and break their will to fight the advancing all Russian army. Which is really, really good for us because they lose defense, which is most important. But they lose attack and lose quite a bit of organization, which is really, really, really good for us. So. I just don't think we have enough divisions, I'll be honest.
I mean, I'm trying to get rid of some of these infantry divisions and convert them just to tanks with SP artillery. Uh, just because that saves a little bit of manpower. And that'll make, it give us a lot more armor so we don't take nearly as many casualties, but still. Uh, uh, talk to Mutatio Ordinis. Albert's eyes looked over the Jarl, city of Jaroslav. He ruled his Reichstag as the Russian majority city following the rather surprising outcome of the West Russian War. Despite the great victories of the Reich against the Slavic hordes, it seemed like war between the Germans and the Russians was once more on the horizon. Why do they keep fighting us? Albert asked out loud. Albert would never admit to this to any of his colleagues, but since the disastrous outcome of the Second West Russian War, or the Russian War, the West Russian War, the man had grown to respect the Russians and their seemingly indomitable will, while the Reich had stagnated, even falling into civil war not long ago. The Russians were rising from the ashes of the failure. When Albert first heard of the news of the Russian reunification, he would have thought it would have been undermanned like Zukov or the collaborators in Samara. He would have never guessed or thought that Vasily Shukshin, a man who hails from the vast rural plains of Siberia, would have brought the Russian nation back together, yet Albert could only watch on in surprise as this man who was once unknown to the world seemingly transformed Russian culture, bringing forth ideals of liberty and democracy. Meanwhile... The Reich refused to move on from its victory in the Second World War. While Russia had learned and evolved from its many mistakes, Germany was still stuck in the past. Albert looked to the streets below, watching the Muscovites go below about the business. In the recent weeks, the people he had governed seemed to be waking up. Protests were becoming more frequent. Demands to rejoin their mother country becoming louder and louder. Despite the great victories of the Reich, it seemed that history was coming to correct itself. As Albert observed a Russian family walking down the street, he asked himself a question that had been on his mind more and more in recent weeks. Are they truly inferior? Ah, uh, question... That every good Nazi needs to ask himself. Are we actually making all these forts here? Oh yeah, we are. Nice. So hopefully, I, I know they're going to naval invade us. Like, let's be real. They, they are 100% going to naval invade us. But when that happens, we're going to turn our tanks around. Because we have 11 divisions of tanks and motorized. Especially 40 combo with. We should do okay-ish. Should. So. Actually. You know what? It's not good enough. APCs, get, throw some armor on there. How, much, how many APCs do we have? We should have quite a few though, right? Oh, our armor is already pretty darn good. We have plenty, plenty, plenty of APCs. Right? It's not bad. We're going to be running out of APCs eventually, but like... Giving this gives us just a little bit more armor, so they're a little bit more tanky. Give them a little more stats. Not as good as tanks, but, you know, whatever. They're broken. Lessons from Barbarossa. Evacuation orders. I'm telling you, the Reich's commissary isn't going to last very long. We need to. The German administrator was discussing in the conference room when the Wehrmacht officer strenuously opened the door. Under orders of the fear, all officials within this building, and the many across Muscovy itself, are to be moved to Germany proper. This building needs to be evacuated immediately. Security breaches and partisan movement have been made this have made this place too dangerous, the officer demanded. The members of the conference got out of their seats and headed for the door. Hurry the F up, Siegfried, you fat dude, before I leave you here for some Slavic beast to blow your brains out. The Wehrmacht officer's commander, bringing his fist on the wall. Right, apologies. Siegfried stood, but before he got on his feet, uh, two feet, a bullet flew into the air. Oh boy. The officer laid in a pool of blood on the floor, a bullet hole straight through the back of his skull. A raggedly dressed partisan wearing the Russian tricolor on his arm entered the room. Armor that took it up in his hand. The door clicked, locked by the hands of another partisan outside. Dmitri lifted his pistol in the air. His own voice boomed with a smile across his face. So right, it's time to get down to business. Dmitri shouted, opening the fire on the ceiling, before pointing it at a German bureaucrat and putting a hole between his eyes. The suited man watched in horror. Dmitri slowly approached one of them. You, you saw a human monster. Don't touch me. I'll not die by the hands of a Slav. A bang rang out. Oh, who's next, huh? Dmitri asked, a smug look on his face. One of the Germans furiously tugged at the locked door before his blood coated that handle slowly. The room was painted red, and Dimitri was the only alive person in the room. He looked out of the window, taking a cigarette out of his pocket and opening the window to the room. He tried dusting some blood off his outfit. You got blood on my outfit, Kraut! Dimitri said to the corpse on the floor. Ha, must have been. Dimitri looked over the scenery. One day, this will all be Russia once again. He puffed a cloud of smoke into the air. Hey, maybe strong, but love is stronger. But we will condemn the Reich. It's time for the Federation to speak directly to the Reich. The world must never forget the unforgivable crimes they've inflicted upon the Russian people and the people of Europe for 40 years. We'll never, we will forever condemn the Reich and we'll never forget the Nazis that have enslaved the Germans into submission and forced their brutal vision upon Europe. So, unfortunately there, to this point I'm sure of many of you guys, we've got to end the episode here. But if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when we will begin the reclamation of Moscow and hopefully all of our lost territories. Thanks for watching. Have a tremendous, tremendous rest of your day.